Good morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you today. Thank you all for your ongoing support during this very long, challenging year. We're going to continue to keep these live streams going strong throughout the year, but we're also starting to think about bringing in-person events back, maybe as early as the summer. Next month, we'll send out a survey to all of you for your input to get your thoughts on when you're gonna feel comfortable coming back to in-person events and what type of events you'd feel most comfortable with. So please stay tuned. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Dan Schnur and politics in the time of coronavirus. Hello, I Kim, how are you? You have another terrific program working for us today with three great topics. Let me just cover those and then hand it right over to you so you have as much time as possible. Uh, topic number one, the Atlanta tragedy, why hate crimes are um, why hate crimes are exploding. Can the US and China find common ground? And third, building a post-pandemic economy. What comes next? Well, I'm sure you'll sh you'll share all of that with us, Dan. Thank you so much. Well, Kim, thank you. And as always, I want to thank all of you for joining us this week and every week. We're always grateful to have so many of you here as part of the conversation. And as we always do, as Kim mentioned, by the time we get to the bottom of the hour, I'll move from my overview of the three topics that Kim just outlined to my favorite part of the program, when as many of you as possible are able to weigh in with your questions as well. So let's get started. Uh, question number one, or topic number one, I outlined last week, excuse me, I outlined earlier this week as tragedy in Atlanta. And obviously, tragically, horribly, that's already dated. Last night when I turned off my computer working on the outline for today's discussion, um, I referred to the shootings in Atlanta as the most recent mass shootings in the United States. And by this morning, of course, that was no longer the case. Uh, the 10 uh, uh, individuals uh, who were killed last night in Boulder, Colorado, remind us just how pervasive uh, this challenge uh, and these horrors can be. The topic that ties both of these uh, tragedies together, of course, is gun violence. And we'll talk about that next week in more detail. Uh, President Biden is holding the first news conference since take his first news conference since taking office this upcoming Thursday. And while he did talk about last night's shootings in Colorado briefly, uh, I think it'll be important to hear what he has to say in more breadth and depth when he addresses this topic in that Thursday news conference. This morning, he reiterated his call for a ban on assault weapons, a broader ban on assault weapons, and for closing the loopholes on background checks. But this is a conversation we'll be having yet again. And once the president has weighed in and laid out the parameters for that discussion, we'll come back to it next week. In the meantime, though, uh, this week, I'd like to talk about Atlanta primarily in the context of hate crimes, and also in the contact, context of the anti-Asian bias that we've seen uh, grow so uh, remark remarkably in this country over the last 12 months since the onset of the coronavirus pandemic. So there's a lots of other aspects of this conversation to go through. But let's start right away with uh, our first question. And this is a personal one for all of you to answer. And so here we have a thank you very much, Claire. Do you know anyone who has made negative remarks about Asian Americans since the COVID pandemic came to the US roughly this time last year? Option number one, yes, uh, a family member or a close friend who's made such comments. Uh, option two, yes, I do know someone who said such things, but it's more of a casual acquaintance. Or third, I don't know anyone who's who's made these types of comments. And so let's, uh, Claire, let's see what kind of responses we get from our group. Very interesting, uh, because as I think all of you know, there has been an explosion 
in the number uh, of cases of harassment, assaults, verbal abuse, and all other sorts of mistreatment of Asian Pacific Islanders in this country um, over, the last, over the last 12 months. But it is notable that so few of us happen to know people who've made those, who've made those types of comments. Fully 88% said that we don't know anyone, even casually, who has said something critical or, or pejorative toward Asian Americans uh, since the arrival of COVID early in 2020. Very, very interesting topic. And we'll come back to more questions for you, uh, more policy-based in, uh, in just a minute or two. So the question uh, that I reflect on, not for a poll question, but one that I'd, I'd like you to think about as well, because I think it is an important one, is the question of whether, uh, the question of whether the murders in Atlanta were worse than those in Boulder, Colorado, because they were committed against members of a specific ethnic and racial group. Now, I ask that question not just for philosophical reasons, because it has very important real-world consequences. And let's talk for just a minute about the concept and definition and application of hate crimes. Because of course, as all of you know, hate crimes, um, hate crimes according to the law at the federal level and in 47 of the 50 states around the country, hate crimes are crimes that are motivated by bias on the basis of race, religion, sexual orientation, or ethnicity. <clears throat> now in some states, including the state of Georgia, by the way, gender is also included as uh, a bias motivator that would elevate uh, a crime like this one to a hate crime. And in many states, age and gender identity are also included in that definition. And in order to be charged, as a hate crime, these types of attacks, whether assaults or killings or even vandalism, must be directed at individuals because of those prohibited biases. So in other words, hate crimes punish motive. The prosecutor in court has to convince a judge or jury that the victim or victims were targeted because of their race, religion, their sexual orientation or other protected characteristic. And if a defendant is found to have acted with bias motivation, hate crimes often add an additional penalty to the underlying charge. So charging people with a hate crime then uh, presents, well, creates a much more complicated situation in what otherwise might be a much more straightforward case for prosecutors. Bias motivation is hard to prove. And too often, prosecutors can be reluctant to take on cases that may, they may not win in court. And because motivation is so hard to prove, we know that this man in Atlanta killed eight innocent people, but we're not entirely sure why. There's very strong evidence that he killed six of these eight individuals because of their ethnic and racial heritage, but it's gonna take some time to determine if the killings were hate crimes or not. Did this young man commit these crimes because of the racial or ethnic heritage of the victims? Um, there's been all sorts of discussion about his own sexual habits and whether these were these individuals were targeted because of gender or whether there are other reasons. We don't know yet. And so in most state laws and in federal law, as I said earlier, defining a crime as a hate crime means an enhanced penalty. And for misdemeanors in the state of Georgia, that means a couple of extra thousand dollars of fine. Uh, for a lower level felony, that can require a year or two in prison. That might not otherwise might not be the case for say, some type of, uh, some type of assault. But for a murder, if someone is convicted of premeditated murder in almost every state Georgia included, the penalty is in those states that don't have the death penalty. The penalty is a life sentence in prison. And so the practical distinction between a more generally defined crime and a hate crime in the case of murder or murders 
is simply a question of whether the assailant would someday be eligible for parole. Again, the distinction is between a life sentence, if this is ultimately judged not to be a hate crime, and life without parole, if these, if these murders are. And I raised the question more broadly a little bit earlier, but I would like to, to frame it in the context less philosophically and more practically. So Claire, for all of you. So Claire, maybe we can put up the second question for the group. What do you think? Should someone who commits a violent crime because of the victim's race or gender face a harsher penalty for their action? In other words, we've seen two shootings in the last week, one in Atlanta, one in Boulder, Colorado. If the killings in Georgia are judged to be hate crimes, that assailant will face a harsher penalty, life without parole. If, and we don't know much about the circumstances in Colorado yet, if the alleged murderer in Colorado is convicted, but not of a hate crime, because these murders were not directed against a particular protected class, say murders, 10 rather than eight, tragically, horribly, but he would not be uh, eligible, uh, or he would, he would not be sentenced under quite such harsh uh, uh, requirements. What do you think about that? Should someone be judged more harshly because of the nature of the crime? Look at that, three, more than three quarters of you, 79% of you say that someone who commits a violent crime because of the victim's race or gender, or presumably other protected class, should face a harsher penalty for their actions. And my guess is what you've concluded is what many Americans have concluded, is that a hate crime a crime committed against someone because of their race, their gender, their religion, isn't just a crime against the individual, it is a crime against an entire community. So the murders in Atlanta last week weren't just committed against these eight people, six of whom were of Asian Pacific heritage. They were committed, it will be argued, against an entire Asian Pacific community. The synagogue, uh, 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 attacks in Poway and in Pittsburgh not too long ago weren't just committed against the congregants, the individuals and families who belong to those particular synagogues, but against the Jewish people. And so hence is the distinction between designated in, uh, an attack as a hate crime versus a, a more general crime. And we'll see in the days and weeks ahead what the prosecutors in Georgia and federal prosecutors decide about this one because there's already immense pressure to make this a hate crime. And I suspect primarily because regardless of the individual's motives, and we still don't know, these murders come on the heels of a year of dramatically increased hateful actions taking against members of the Asian Pacific Islander community here in this country. So before we go any further on that question, uh, on that point, Claire, maybe we can go with the third question here because now we're moving the discussion from hate crimes to more generally how we think about underrepresented communities in this country who are targeted because of uh, events like those we've just discussed. So question for you, is the tragedy, did the tragedy in Atlanta last week change your thinking about Americans' attitudes toward those of Asian descent? Now, let me define what I mean by that. And you can see that in the options presented to you. Yes, uh, the tragedy did change my thinking. I'm now more aware and more concerned about mistreatment of Asian Americans in this country than I was before last week. Option two, no, I was already greatly concerned about how Asian Pacific Islanders have been treated in this country, not just over the last year, but throughout our nation's history. Or third, no, I do not think this is a matter for great concern. Not that we ever want to see anyone mistreated, but that this is not one of particular concern versus other types of oppression. So how did we, uh, how did we come out in this one, Claire? Oh, this is really, this is fascinating. Um, almost a even split, 50%, exactly half, said I'm more aware and more concerned about persecution of Asian Pacific Islanders in this country as a result of the shooting. 
And 46% said, no, I was already greatly concerned about it. So to me, in a lot of ways, this underscores uh, the sentiment that you were expressing, many of you are expressing in question number two. This wasn't just a crime against eight individuals. In addition to that, it was a crime against a community. And therefore, the majority of you concluded the uh, penalty should be, should be a harsher one. Let's move on. And I know we'll talk about this during the questions because it's such an important issue. And I'll be eager to hear what your thoughts are on it. But let's move on to question number two. And I will tell you uh, that talking about the US-China relationship, if you remember, is something we decided last week before the shootings took place. And so it is a coincidence that we're talking first about discrimination against Asian Americans, and second, talking about the geopolitics of the Pacific Rim. Um, but the two topics are related, of course, in ways, ways that we'll talk about a little bit later, because too often in our country and elsewhere along the world, or around the world, is ill feelings toward another country, whether it be China, whether it be another nation in, on the Pacific Rim, in Latin America, in, in Europe, in Africa, Russia, can also lead to very uh, uh, mo uh, uh, malicious feelings toward individuals of that heritage in, in this country. And we've already seen some evidence that the increasing animosity between the US and China on the global and geopolitical level is feeding in to the animus against Asian Pacific Islanders in this country as well. But let's, let's talk now just about the, the geopolitics. Let's talk about US and China and where that relationship is headed. And it appears that right now that that relationship is gonna get a lot worse before it gets better. Now we've talked about a lot of the reasons for this in the past. We've talked about economic aggression on the part of China, intellectual property rights, uh, trade policy and so on. We've talked about military aggression in the South China Sea and elsewhere. And we've talked about human rights in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, and in Northwest China. So before we get more into the details of this topic, Claire, maybe we can put up our next question for the group to get their thoughts. So with all this going on between the United States and China, economic, security, and human rights issues, the question is, how should the Biden administration approach relations with China? Should we, number one, be more conciliatory than Trump has been? Number two, be more confrontational than to the Trump administration was? Or third, should, we, uh, should the Biden administration take about the same level of, uh, uh, of engagement and the same type of tone of engagement with China as his predecessor did? Let's see what we got. Uh, this is a very split group. Just over a third, 36%, believe that Biden should be more, more conciliatory than Trump. 39% a little bit more, but not that much more, say more confrontational, and 25% say about the same. So that is about as closely divided a group on a question as I think we've seen on any question that we put to all of you. We're roughly divided. Should Biden be tougher on China or should he be more conciliatory? Well, based on at least the last, uh, or the, based on at least the first several weeks of Biden's presidency, it looks like the president and his administration have decided to veer very much on the side of aggression. Uh, just last week, Secretary of State Tony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan held their first summit with their counterparts from China. Uh, this took place in Alaska last week. And the, the public portion of the, of the meeting between the country's leaders was very aggressive and devolved very quickly into extremely harsh accusations in which both countries' representatives were essentially accusing their opposite numbers of all sorts of inappropriate behavior, behavior both, in their, both within their own countries and on the global stage. Um, this is a very unusual publicly hostile exchange of, uh, of statements between two countries in these types, in this, these types of settings, which tend to be very highly scripted, uh, but it got, it got pretty ugly pretty quickly. And it's worth noting that the day afterward, President Biden made a point of telling the media that he was very proud 
of the way Secretary of State Blinken had conducted himself in that hearing. So very strong message from the Biden administration toward China that they intend to take a much more aggressive approach and an equally strong response from China that they're not backing down one bit. But, and this is where I suspect many of you opted on the side of conciliation, at the same time that the Biden administration was adopting a more confrontational tone, a more combative tone toward China in last week's summit, they've also been working over time to strengthen and re-strengthen diplomatic relationships with historical allies so that when, so as the U.S. confronts China on economic and military and human rights measures, they're not acting alone. So we've seen over the same time period that Biden is, ra is, is ratcheting up the language against China to a fairly high level of bellicosity. At the same time, the president and his team are reaching out very, very uh, insistently to allies in the Pacific Rim and elsewhere. The so-called the Quad, the so-called Quad, made up of the U.S., Japan, India, and Australia, which has historically not been a particularly active alliance, appears to be taking on a much greater level of import. And the United States and those other three countries are seeing this relationship as much more critical in terms of all of their relationships with China. At the same time that Blinken and Sullivan were meeting with the Chinese. The U.S. Secretary of Defense, Secretary Austin, was in India meeting with the leaders of that country. And the United States uh, uh, diplomatic corps have been working over time with European allies to revitalize those relationships. And we saw the results of that just yesterday when the United States and the European Union and Great Britain and, and Canada, for that matter, collectively imposed sanctions on China for China's treatment of ethnic minorities in the northwest part of, of, of that country. Now, the U.S. has imposed any number of sanctions on China in recent years, but the fact that the U.S. and the EU did this together with Great Britain and Canada shows a real, does show a real revitalization of these relationships. And we should note that late last year, the European Union signed a fairly comprehensive new trade agreement with China, despite the fact that President-elect Biden made it clear publicly that he didn't think that was a good idea. By signing on to these sanctions, the Europeans have probably uh, put the trade deal that they just signed with China in great danger, but already we're beginning to see the results of a more considered diplomatic effort on the Biden administration's part, not just in terms of confronting China as part of an alliance, but even getting some of our allies to walk back from other trade uh, agreements that they have struck with China. So you've heard me over the months refer to this, at least potentially, to the US-China relationship as potentially the new Cold War. Well, we saw it take a decided term for the Chile last week. And I think the temperature is going to continue to get colder and colder again before, uh, before things uh, begin to warm between the two countries. There's all sorts of ways of demonstrating unhappiness or dissatisfaction with China. Um, sanctions, deployment of military assets in the South China Sea and elsewhere, but some are more symbolic. So I'm going to close this topic by asking you about a more symbolic measure that the Biden administration is now considering. As some of you may have heard, the Winter Olympic Games next year, not the Summer Games, which are, are still scheduled to take place in Japan this summer, at least for now. But next year, the Winter Olympics are scheduled to take place in Beijing. And there are already questions being raised by human rights advocates all over the world about whether other countries should boycott next year's Olympics in China. The same way the United States boycotted the Olympic Games held in Moscow way back in 1980 during Jimmy Carter's presidency. So Claire, let's put up this fifth and last question for our group and see what everybody here thinks. Granted, it's more of a symbolic than a substantive measure, but should the U.S. try to send a strong message by boycotting the Winter Olympics in Beijing next year? Yes, 
China should know that the U.S. and our allies will not stand for the types of human rights abuses that were criticized? Or alternatively, the other answer, no, the U.S. would be better off engaging with China rather than, uh, rather than isolating in a way that these types of, uh, that this type of boycott would do. And how did we do on this one, Claire? Mm. One third of you said that the U.S. should boycott the Olympics. 67% two thirds say no. Let's keep an eye on this question, Claire. And as the year progresses, as relationships between the U.S. and China either improve or continue to devolve, Let's see how our own group feels about that question as current events uh, as current events continue to progress. Third and finally, and unfortunately, we'll only talk about this topic relatively briefly, at least in in my segment, is we'd like to talk. I'd like to talk briefly about now that Biden has passed and signed the COVID relief bill. What does he do next, particularly when it comes to economic recovery? Biden has drawn a, a, very, uh, a, a very stark line between what he considers rescue on one hand and revitalization on the other. So now that the rescue package of the COVID relief bill was signed, what comes next? And what we've learned just in the last couple of days is that the infrastructure package that the Biden administration has been talking about since the president was sworn in back in January we're starting to get a better sense of what that infrastructure package might look like. Well, first of all, it's gonna be big. The COVID relief bill was $1.9 trillion. The infrastructure package that the Biden administration is considering could end up being twice that. They're talking about a package of between three and $4 trillion, which is, you don't need me to tell you, is an awful lot of money. And the package that they're, con they're considering, at least right now, the White House is talking about dividing the broader infrastructure uh, project into two very separate uh, uh, legislative packages. The first legislative package is what we generally think of when it comes to infrastructure, roads, bridges, hospitals. And in addition to that, expanded broadband access, particularly in, in rural and isolated areas around the country, and a great deal of money committed to developing a new infrastructure reflecting the importance of, of, of climate change uh, challenges heading forward. So instead of just rebuilding the old electricity grid, for example, putting together a new grid that is more environmentally friendly as well as buildings and transportation and other types of infrastructure that recognize the challenges of climate change. So that's step one, and that's what we've been hearing a lot about. But just in the last day is what we now understand is that the Biden administration is thinking about dividing what they call infrastructure into two pieces. The first, which I just mentioned, and then the second one, which focuses on childcare, on preschool, on community colleges, on K through 12 and investing great sums of money in what one might call human infrastructure in this country. Uh, both of these bills, uh, in, uh, according to Biden's uh, preferred approach, would be paid for not through additional increased uh, deficits, uh, but rather through increasing taxes. And Biden has made no secret of the fact through his presidency and through his campaign that he wants to repeal the Trump tax cuts. And we'll see whether that ends up being enough to pay for a package like this once we have a better sense of its overall scope and ambition. But on the first of those two packages, the roads, the bridges, the broadband, the climate change infrastructure, that would be paid for by an increased tax on businesses, on an increased corporate tax. The human infrastructure, the childcare, the preschool, and the other similar types of programs that I mentioned, those would be paid for by taxes on the wealthy, those making $400,000 a year or more. And as you might suspect, while Republicans have indicated that they would like to try to find ways to work with Biden on infrastructure, they're not nearly as excited about raising taxes. And so already we're gonna be seeing an internal debate within the Democratic Party about whether Biden should attempt to reach out to Republicans to put together this next package in a bipartisan way, uh, 
Or alternatively, should he instead turn to the same reconciliation process that he used to pass the COVID relief bill with 51 votes? It'll be months and months before we know the answers to those questions, and we'll come back to them any number of times as this package moves forward. It hasn't even been formally pr proposed yet. But this does seem to be the early marker that Biden is laying down for his next step forward. It'll be fascinating to see not only how Republicans respond, but how the members of his own party react as well. So look at that. We're at the bottom of the hour. Uh, we're at uh, 1130, at least in California. And so at this point, um, I've covered my three topics. And so I'm hoping that Jessica might be willing to join me. There she is. Jessica, thank you for being with us as always. And I'm eager to get to the questions that you've been fielding from our audience members. How's it look? Uh, we got a lot coming in. This, these are very uh, uh, question generating topics, I guess. So um, I'm going to combine these first two. Uh, it was, is what constitutes a hate crime clearly legally defined through the US? And should the legal definition of hate crime be revised, or, sorry, revisited both in terms of the categories and in terms of the threshold for prosecuting it? Okay, so throughout the country, both at the federal level and in 47 of the 50 states, the general definition of hate crime is consistent. That would be a crime committed against a member of one of those protected classes I mentioned earlier. In every, uh, in every uh, uh, one of the 47 states and at the federal level as well, for example, racial and ethnic heritage and religion are considered to be a protected a protection that would lead to the implementation of hate crime uh, penalties being imposed. But from state to state around the country, there's a wide range of other categories that may or may not be included, gender, gender identity, and others that are included under the purview of hate crimes in some states and not in others. Um, would it make sense to have a common definition I think that's more that's it's an argument more about federalism. Should every state decide for itself which classes, which groups should be protected or not, or should it be decided by the by the federal government? I don't have a I don't have a good answer for that, but I suspect it would be a difficult a challenge in court for the federal government to tell states how broad or uh, how intense their criminal justice uh, statutes ought to be. So there will be some inconsistency around the country, uh, most notably three states that have no hate crime protections at all. But I do think it would be a, a it would be difficult for the federal government to impose a national standard because generally criminal justice issues tend to be handled at the state level. Now, of course, some crimes are uh, yeah, are, yeah, are are dealt with at the federal level. And one of the questions in Atlanta right now is whether the killings there last week should be uh, dealt with by state level law or by federal hate crime statute. And we don't know how that's going to be resolved yet. But ultimately, all in all, right now, while 47 of the 50 states and the federal government all do have hate crime uh, penalties on the book, there is a wide range in terms of both the breadth of under what circumstances they'd be applied and the intensity in terms of how harsh the penalties would be for a hate crime versus a more, uh, a more traditional type of criminal activity. Oh, lost you for a second, uh, Jessica. Next, sorry, this next question then might kind of fall into that, is it a federal or, or a state issue? But um, this questioner asked, if a black person kills a white person or a person of Asian descent kills a white person, or an LGBTQ person kills a straight person, is it investigated as a possible hate crime? I know the answer for that as it relates to race-based hate crimes. And any crime committed against anyone because of their racial or ethnic, and for that matter, religious heritage, that would be considered a hate crime. I have to admit I'm not certain on whether that exists on matters of gender identity. I know on matter of gender they do. If someone is killed because they're a woman or because they're a man, um, then that is considered a hate crime. I have to admit I don't know what the what the statute is on gender on, on gender identity. But 
at least on, on racial and ethnic and religious matters, even uh, you know, if someone, regardless of their own racial makeup, were to uh, attack, assault, or murder individuals uh, because of uh, be because they were white, that would fall under the protect that, that would fall under the umbrella of a hate crime. It's worth noting just real quick, and this uh, is something relevant to both of the questions that have come up so far. There is legislation before Congress currently that would strengthen the current federal law on hate crimes. But interestingly, what this law does not do is it does not call for further enhanced penalties. What it instead focuses on is increased training for law enforcement officers and prosecutors in courts to identify and successfully prosecute hate crimes. And it's also designed to improve the reporting process, both to encourage individuals to report these types of crimes and also to include in, improve the data collected so we can have a better idea of how frequent or, uh, frequent or prevalent these types, of th these types of things are. So the bill, at least in Congress, would not strengthen the penalties, but rather would focus on training and on information uh, gathering and dissemination, which it appears a majority in Congress feel is a more pressing need for getting the arms around this challenge than stronger penalties would be. Does the hate crime include policemen who kill unarmed black men? Uh, hate crime uh, applies to any individual, regardless of their profession. So a member of the police force who committed a crime specifically because of the race or ethnicity or religion or gender of the other individual or individuals, that person would be charged with a hate crime. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the challenge is ascertaining not what the crime was, but rather what the motive was. So just to take one example, let's talk about the police officers in Minneapolis uh, who were responsible for the death of George Floyd. It is looking likely, not definite, but it's looking fairly likely that the police officer most directly involved um, is being tried for, and if I may guess, be likely to be found guilty of some level of murder, whether first, second, or third degree. And that's a relatively straightforward proposition because ultimately Mr. Floyd perished as a result of, of their encounter, it's been, it's been argued. That said, proving that the police officer conducted himself the way he did because George Floyd is African-American as opposed to the way he was conducting himself or responding or whatever the, the argument that the defense might make, um, that's tougher to tell. Uh, that's tougher to that's tougher to figure out for sure. Do we know when someone commits a crime? And we should, by the way, we've been talking about about murders here because horribly that's what happened in Atlanta and in Minneapolis. <clears throat> but a hate crime can be assault. It can be verbal harassment. Even it can be a property crime, like the the the, the burning or the destruction of a building. So any of these types of crimes can be hate, hate crimes as long as the prosecutor can prove that the crime was committed because of the demographic characteristics um, of the victim. Some of these are pretty straightforward. Yeah, if there is a noose left behind, just disgustingly, then that carries obviously a very strong historical racial connotation. I mentioned earlier the buildings, the burnings of a synagogue. Beyond that, sometimes, will see an assailant make a public statement, either verbally or in writing or online, about his or her intentions. But short of that, it becomes very, very difficult to come to a reliable conclusion about the reason that a criminal commits uh, this type of crime. And that's why so many of these crimes aren't classified as hate crimes. And one of the reasons that Congress is devoting its next steps toward improving training to perhaps make it more likely that such a determination can, can, can be arrived at. This questioner says, I believe the shooter in Atlanta chose his targets because of the nature of the businesses, massage parlors, not the employees. What does Dan think about this premise? Well, 
we don't know yet. Um, it's been pointed out that the individual himself has talked about all sorts of, of social and sexual difficulties he had that may have led him to target uh, females. And there's been statements by a former roommate of his and another acquaintance back up that argument. Um, on the other hand, it's also been pointed out that there are many, many, many massage parlors in the greater Atlanta area. The two that this man attacked were more than 20 miles apart from each other. Uh, they were known to, uh, these established ones were known to employ Asian American women uh, yeah, yeah, to work there. And there's going to be a long investigation, I would guess, before we learn, before the, before we learn whether the motivation was based on the victim's race, on the victim's gender, or for some other completely, uh, for some, for some completely, uh, completely other, re uh, complete other reason. But I would go back to a point that I made during the first half of the program. Ultimately, whether these crimes are classified as hate crimes or not, it's not going to make a great deal of difference in terms of the sentence this man receives. But whether they're reported as hate, uh, prosecuted as hate crimes or not, they've served, and our own poll shows us ample evidence of this. These crimes serve to remind us that we as a people, we of a country, have not acted as aggressively as we should to protect the Asian Americans among, a, among us from the abuse and vilification that they've suffered over the last year. Of course, hate crimes are not unique to the Asian Pacific community. Uh, the Latino community faces these crimes often in the context of very heated debates over immigration. The African American community, the LGBT community, women, there's no shortage of protected classes that face these kind of challenges. But whether this is a, this, these were hate crimes or not, and I have no idea, either way, they will serve to remind the rest of us as a country that we have an obligation to stand up to our fellow citizens, for our fellow citizens, regardless of race, religion, ethnic heritage, or any other classification, when they are unfairly targeted and persecuted. It's an awful long way of saying, I don't know. But at least in this context, if it woke us up to remind us of our obligation to underrepresented communities and our friends who live in those communities, then whether it's ultimately prosecuted as a hate crime or not is less relevant. It motivated us to respond in a, in a, more, in a, in a more appropriate manner. Even before the Atlanta shooting, there were several examples of Asian Americans being attacked, beaten, and killed on the streets. And many younger Asians in these communities are starting to create their own neighborhood groups to patrol streets and accompany vulnerable seniors in their communities. How can law enforcement interact with and support this type of community patrolling? And what does it say when citizens are having to step up like this? Well, it's unfortunate that it's necessary for citizens to have to step up like this. Um, that said, I think it's commendable that individuals have decided that standing up to protect their communities is something that they're willing to do. The only thing that is even that's more impressive than individuals standing up to protect their own communities is when we stand up to protect each other. So in other words, these neighborhood patrols ideally wouldn't just be made up of Asian Pacific Islanders but of representatives from other communities as well. And when these other communities are targeted as Asian Pacific Islanders have been in the context of the COVID pandemic, that members of that community would participate in neighborhood watches when others are facing similar types of, of harassment and aggression and assault. Um, everything I've seen suggests that police in most of these communities welcome the community involvement as long as the community or mem members who are part of these types of, of neighborhood watches um, don't try to take the law into their own hands. But if a potential transgressor, if a potential assailant sees large numbers of people from a community or, or more broadly standing up in protection 
of an establishment, a house of worship, a business, uh, a, a school, I think that sends a, a very important and very beneficial signal. So all in all, this is a good thing as long as civilians participating in these programs understand that their job is to serve as the eyes and ears for law enforcement, not to act in their place. Thank you. What do you think about the Chinese foreign minister stating that the U.S. is the pot calling the kettle black on human rights issues? Well, my first instinct is to agree with Secretary Blinken's and National Security Advisor Sullivan's response, which is to point out that when in this country there are there is some type of social injustice, we shine a light on it. The media reports on it. The community gathers. There's active steps taken to address it. To me, the biggest difference, and in every country, in every society, there's the, going to be those types, unfortunately, those types of uh, of uh, of activities. Um, but I think in this country, we make an effort to address them publicly and work to correct them. I think all too often in China, the natural instinct of the government there is to suppress them and to hide them. And so I think it's imp I think it's important for our representatives to draw that distinction, to acknowledge that injustice takes place everywhere. The question is how you address it and in what kind of a public manner and it, it, it's a it's 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 a difficult it's it, it's a difficult question because when the United States calls out other countries around the world for some type of inappropriate internal and domestic behavior, obviously our country is vulnerable to similar to to you know, to uh, the same types of criticisms also, but I do think the distinction is how they're handled, and I think the United States can be confident that uh, the Sullivan and Blinken approach is one that's going to resonate worldwide much more than the original accusation. Um, I thought it was interesting. I was in when I took the group to Taiwan in April of 2015, and they had their newspapers there. They were talking about the Michael Brown shootings here in the U.S. and indicating, you know, look at the horrible things that America is doing to its own citizens. So the fact that you know this is this is a playbook, this is an angle that that they will try to approach. But to your point, it's not our government's policy um, to do the things that are being done there. So you're exactly right, Jessica. And this is the type of criticism that we heard in the 20th century from the, from the Soviet Union. And once again, I think it's important to remember that, that on one hand, yes, our country is guilty of some very horrific social injustices. But once again, the distinction is the efforts that we make to identify them and to, and to correct them. And the discussion we had about earlier in the program about the shootings in Atlanta is a perfect example of that if this does turn out to be a hate crime uh, targeted against a particular ethnic group, then that's something that has already and will continue to receive immense amounts of attention and redress as opposed to denial. So far, climate change was the sole area where the US and the People's Republic of China said the meeting in Alaska made progress. I was surprised that there was no progress on COVID-19 vaccine, sorry, vaccines. Do you think because of vaccine diplomacy slash competition to Latin America and Africa? Well, Blinken and Sullivan and their, and their staffs said that the private meeting between the two, private meetings between the two countries was much more productive than the public uh, confrontation was. And so if that's the case, we assume that not just on climate change, but on COVID, that's the case also. But the questioner makes a really good point. And as we've talked about in this program before, China has worked very, very hard uh, to forward what's become known as vaccine diplomacy around the country, making their vaccines available uh, to countries that otherwise haven't been able to protect their own citizens. And while the United States has in the last week or two made it clear that we will begin to share large numbers of vaccines with Canada and Mexico and then with other countries around the world, 
there's no question that China and Russia have done much more of this uh, and much more quickly. The, the cynic in me will point out that it's easier to send vaccines to other countries when public opinion in your own country does not impact the way the government operates to the extent that it does here. But regardless of the reason for it, China clearly established a very early advantage in terms of its outreach to Latin America, to Africa, and to the Middle East. And the US is gonna be scrambling to, to catch up. It's entirely possible as the questioner suggested that China might be less cooperative with not just the US, but the World Health Organization, knowing that uh, their ability to distribute vaccines in such large numbers may play to their benefit on a world stage and may therefore ease the pressure for them to be more forthcoming uh, as it relates to the origins of the virus. The USA boycotted the Olympics in the USSR way back in 1980. Did that boycott accomplish what it set out to do? Well, I have to admit, I don't have a good answer for that question. It is worth noting that it had very little immediate impact. If anything, it was a huge black eye in terms of reputation and image for the Soviet Union. So that might have been the primary impact. On the other hand, we could point out that by the end of that decade, the Berlin Wall had fallen and the Soviet Union was no more. I'm not smart enough to know whether the reputational impact of the boycott played a role in the ultimate dissolution of the Soviet Union. I suspect it was a contributing factor, but I wouldn't know how to quantify how much of a factor it was. My memory is that the US decided to achieve the uh, take on the boycott of the Moscow Olympics, not because there was strong, uh, strong confidence that it would change the Soviet's behavior, but rather that it would send a message to the rest of the world that the Soviet's behavior was unacceptable. <laughs> If the US did decide to boycott the Winter Olympics in Beijing next year, I don't think anyone in the Biden administration would believe realistically that it would change the Chinese uh, agenda on human rights, but rather I think what they hope it would do is shine a brighter light on, uh, on some of that activity, not to change it at least in the short run, but to attempt to isolate China not just in terms of image, but on the diplomatic and economic fronts that we were talking about earlier. People complain that China poses an economic threat to the US, yet American corporations continue to both source goods from China and establish factories to produce goods cheaply. How do we reconcile this? Well, in this country for many, many years, the term industrial policy, the idea of government making private sector decisions on behalf of manufacturing and industry has been considered very unacceptable, that that's not what a free market society ought to do. But if you listen, not just to Biden, but to leading Republicans as well, there's a growing sentiment that in order to compete with China economically, it will require some type of national policy here to revitalize and to expand US-based manufacturing. Now, we've talked about a little bit today, but in, you know, in, in, in weeks past at great length about the increasing polarization between the two parties in this country. They weren't able to work together on COVID. It now is looking like it might be more difficult for them to work together on the types of infrastructure issues we talked about a little bit earlier. What's worth noting is that Senate Majority Leader Schumer, who really does want to accomplish something in a bipartisan fashion rather than always having to rely on reconciliation, Schumer is putting together legislation in which he's working very, very closely with Republican senators. That would be a US manufacturing strategy designed to confront uh, China and its, and its strength in this area. So uh, Biden's medium to long-term solution is to create more of a manufacturing base here so that US corporations would not be as reliant on China in the short run, it could be it could have the potential for one of those rare uh, examples of bipartisanship in which the two two parties actually work together. What do you think the response of the United States and Japan will be if China does in fact attack or invade Taiwan? 
Will we be willing to engage in an all-out war to honor our treaty with and defend Taiwan? I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, the U.S. has uh, stated publicly that they would uh, defend Taiwan militarily. I don't know if the isolationist, isolationist sentiments that we've talked about in this country uh, so many weeks over the past year would allow for a president of either party to engage mainland China militarily over Taiwan. Um, I suspect what you'd probably see is a multinational effort, very similar to what we saw in Eastern and Central Europe in the mid and late 1990s. It's, it's very, very difficult to imagine this potential Cold War between the US and China turning into a hot war. But if, the China, if, but if China did decide to engage militarily against Taiwan, it would be the US's obligation. And again, my best guess is the response would not be a unilateral one, but rather one as part of a, um, a multiple nation force. Interestingly enough, NATO, North America Treaty or, uh, Organization, has already indicated that they have some interest in engaging more prominently on the Pacific Rim. But whether an extraordinary occurrence like that would be the outcome, or an arrangement of the quad that we talked about earlier, or more informal alliances, my, my guess, and it is just a guess, is that the US would respond militarily, but as part of a multinational effort. But I think every day China gauges whether the US has the domestic political appetite for that type of engagement. And every day, just as, and I don't want to push the parallel too far, but it's worth remembering that it took FDR, it took Franklin Roosevelt years to convince the American people that it was worth engaging in Europe. I don't think Biden is trying to prepare the US population for the eventuality of military conflict with China, but there's no question he is trying to raise broader public awareness of the challenges we face in that part of the world. And to a large extent, at least according to public opinion polls, he is succeeding. Thank you. Uh, this will be my final question. When the AstraZeneca vaccine receives FDA approval, the U.S. will have an abundance of vaccines. Will the U.S. sell or give these vaccines to underdeveloped countries? That appears to be uh, the, the goal right now. Uh, it, if you didn't see it, it turns out that some of the numbers that were relied on for, for AstraZeneca are now in question. Anthony Fauci made a public statement this morning wondering out loud whether the company had been completely forthcoming in terms of the success of it test, its tests. But let's assume for the sake of argument that that vaccine will be available shortly. I would bet that we'll see a very, very broad effort on the part of the US and its allies to use that as the primary uh, uh, is the primary option for providing vaccinations uh, to other countries around the world. But let's keep an eye on this uh, on this approval process and hope that the numbers are legit so that process so that process can get underway. Well, audience, thank you so much for your great questions. I feel like this hour flew by, so I look forward to seeing you all next Tuesday. Dan, thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica, and thanks to everyone for being here with us. Jessica, thank you for handling the questions so well. We received so many questions for you, Dan, that it's a it's a huge job for part managing that all. Thank you. What a great discussion. And as Jessica said, we have you next Tuesday for continuing to lead us through these uh, crazy um, news cycles. So thank you so very much.